I ask that you would remain standing for the reading of our text today from 1 Peter 5, verses 8 through 11. You will notice that I am skipping the last three verses of the text, uh, the greeting to Sylvanus. Um, that is not invaluable. It, it's not not valuable. It is valuable, but we are going to focus on, as we close, uh, verses 8 through 11 uh, for the application for us here as we close out our year. Reading from 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Father in heaven, these are your words. I pray that you would take these words and apply them to each heart, including my own, for the sake of your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This year, our theme has been refined by fire, and we've walked through First Peter. Uh, we, we've walked through First Peter to see the many ways in which the Christian's life is one that is marked by difficulty, suffering, trial, and challenge, but that those difficulties and sufferings and trials and challenges are actually the process that makes us more and more like Christ. And so as Peter summarizes this letter, uh, he does so with that idea in mind. Peter leaves us in this text with a challenge, with a reality, and with a promise. And, and to those, I would like to draw our attention now. The first is the challenge. And the, the challenge that we see in this text is to persevere. We persevere. Peter uses two commands, and when we look at, at Scripture, we, we, uh, the Bible is not a, a list of do's and don'ts. It's not a rule book. Uh, it's not basic instructions before leaving earth. It is a letter, but there are aspects of God's word in which he does give us commands, and he does so in this text, uh, giving us, in this uh, verse 8 especially, two uh, commands. There's another command in our text, and we'll reference that later, but in these words in verse 8 we see two commands the first is to be sober minded be sober minded when we use the word sober we're usually referring to um, sober as is in one of two ways one would be as an antonym or an opposite for the word drunk right so drunk versus sober or we use it as a synonym at times for the word serious right we're being very sober but Peter's use of this word uh, is more broad than either of these two uses. It's referring to avoiding anything that would cause any hindrance to your faith in Christ. Wayne Grudem, uh, some of you know Wayne Grudem, a good systematician, uh, a theologian, uh, says this. He says, being sober forbids not only physical drunkenness, but also, since the phrases before and after have to do with attitudes of the mind, Letting the mind wander into any other kind of mental in intoxication or addiction which inhibits spiritual alertness. Or any laziness of mind which lulls Christians into sin through carelessness. Or by default, he knows how easily Christians can lose their spiritual con concentration through mental intoxication with the things of this world. End quote. Can you think of any mental intoxications that impede your ability to live for Christ? Certainly the abuse of alcohol is an example of something that does this, uh, but there are other things as well. Uh, I, I think some of the things that we struggle with in, in our world, uh, some of the images that, that come to mind are images from the internet and other places. Pornography. The love of money. The relentless pursuit of gaining more can very often deter our spiritual alertness. The gods that we make of good things, like our hobbies or like our, our, our sports or things we like to do, can often cloud our minds, can't they? From our relationship with Christ. Academic achievement, 
for the sake of academic achievement, for its own sake, can often blur Christ's form and tear us from him. What I mean by that, think about all of the, the experiences. Well, do you really want to waste your time at a Bible college? Don't you want to get ahead with your career? Don't you want to get on with your life and, and, and get certified in this or that or whatever you're going to do, right? Entertainment of all kinds, right? Though not wrong in themselves, those various forms of entertainment, entertainment has become a constant companion, has it not? Our current generation is very focused on being entertained. My, my generation, your generation, I'm talking about this present time. Over one billion hours, one billion hours per day are spent on YouTube alone. We live at a time where constant distractions are the norm. We're not comfortable with our own silence, and so we need to be distracted. There's a lull in the conversation, so what do we do? We take out our phones and we scroll. We binge shows or videos or audiobooks or podcasts, and oftentimes we do so with little white hunks of plastics crammed in our ears so that uh, we, we cannot, or maybe over our ears, right, so that we can completely cancel out the noise from around us. So we don't have to focus on reality. We like to be distracted. We like to, to have eyes that are clouded. And we can go on, right? Just like in the decreased reaction time that takes place when alcohol is, is abused, constant distraction impacts our ability to process our current moment with a, a biblical lens. And when that happens, we end up drifting from God. But, but like in the parable of the sower, we, we saw that, didn't we? The parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, if you're not familiar with it, you can go and read it. But, but it's like the seed that was cast out, which was the word of God. It took root, it grew, but it was choked out by the things of this world. How many believers have you seen take this path? Imagine that sadly we could probably, each of us, think of many. The call to sober-mindedness is a call to focus on the word of God, to hear it, to obey it. It should be the lens through which our pursuits are viewed. It, it, it's just like that seed, like I was saying before, that fell on good soul, a soil. We should hear that word. We should let it take root in our hearts as, it, as it's preached and taught. To let it take root and to bear fruit. The second command in verse 8, is not just to be sober-minded, but to be watchful. The second command here is this idea with, with one's eyes clear, with their mind ready for an unimpeded view of Christ, this now is an opportunity to, to take that, that command to, to avoid the things that would cloud our minds and to focus on the things that are important, to actively engage in judgment of our current situation in our world. Al Mohler, in his daily podcast, uh, The Briefing, if you've ever listened to it, you'll, you'll know that he uses uh, this word a lot. I, I'm not a big fan of, of uh, adverbs in writing or speaking. I use them, but it's one of the things that annoy me about my own writing and speaking. But he says, we need to think Christianly. And I thought, that's a terrible adverb, but it's true. We need to be thinking Christianly about topics that our world faces today. It's the, the call to, to be discerning. It's a call to think well. It's a call to know the word and interpret the issues and the current events and their underlying philosophies according to that word of God. To borrow from a, a basketball term, uh, we just concluded the college basketball season nationally last night. Um, and I really didn't care about those teams, so I'm not going to talk about it. But to borrow a team, a, a term, excuse me, that we have in basketball, we need to have, as Christians, good court vision. We need to have eyes that can quickly discern the defensive strategy so that we can know where to go with the ball or where to be to get the ball. Uh, just like it, it, one of the fun things to watch, I didn't like the teams last night, but I do, do like watching Caitlin Clark play most of the time. Didn't like her on Sunday, but that's, she's still great, right? But, but it's fun to watch her pass, how she sees the defense and knows how to get the ball to her players. It's, it's second to none, except for Ronnie Nessa. You're a little bit better than Caitlin. I've watched some good passes there, right? But we have some skill. That's, that's what we're called to be. We're called to develop court vision. We need to develop these eyes in our own life, in our community of believers, 
to understand where Satan is going to try and attack or cause division, accuse, condemn. We need to to know those areas of temptation where we're most likely to fall before we get to those areas of temptation. And we need to build up our defenses for those moments to fortify our chances for victory. The Spirit's, uh, uh, excuse me, being in the Word is the key to this, right? The key again. To be in the Word, to show us how to be watchful, how to be ready for those moments. And as the Spirit applies that Word to our heart, He enables us to have that spiritual court vision. The, the second reason that we need to be sober-minded, or, or excuse me, not the second reason, the second point in, our, in uh, our text today that I'm, if you're following and taking notes, the reason that we need to be sober-minded and watchful is that in this text, Peter describes a reality. And that reality is that Satan prowls. We have a, we persevere, Satan prowls. We we need to be sober-minded and watchful because we have an enemy that opposes us. He wants us to fail, and he would go to great lengths to have us walk away from the promises of Christ. Peter says that the devil, which by the way is the Greek word for slander or slanderer, right, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking somebody to devour it's been a, a sticky point of theology for me a little bit uh, b- because as, as we read what happened at the cross, Colossians 2.15 clearly describes that at the cross, Jesus disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame. This indicates that, that just as our record of debt was canceled at the cross, <clears throat> Satan was also defeated and rendered useless. So how can he be prowling around? And I think it's this. I think the picture here of this prowling lion is one of a defeated ruler who knows that his time is short. And and though he cannot, under any circumstance, undo the debt cancellation of the faithful, he can and does try to get them to doubt and to become unfaithful. That's what the devil, he, he does this. That's what his title means. He's an accuser. He loves to slander you. He loves to remind you of your sin. He loves to remind you of your failures. He loves to misrepresent God's promises. He, he is a, a slanderer from the beginning. The very first words out of his mouth, did God really say? Did God really say? He wants us to misunderstand. He wants us to misconstrue God's design and his plan for us. And he does this in a variety of ways. And oftentimes this comes in ways masquerading, as as the text of scripture says, as angels of light. That's what Lucifer means, actually. His name that we use sometimes means light bearer. He's deceptive. C.S. Lewis, if you guys have, how many have read screw tape letters in here? Fantastic book in in so many ways. He describes the heart of the Roaring Lions methodology. He writes from this perspective of a senior demon teaching and instructing his nephew demon on how to tempt the human race. It's a primer on how the devil manipulates and deceives us in subtle ways, exploring all of the ways in which the lion hunts and how we become susceptible to his attacks. It's great it's a great book on understanding the Christian life. And for those of you who did not raise your hand, I would encourage you to go and, and read it or listen to it. It's a good listen, too, uh, on an audio book. According, according to this, though, as we, we look at these temptations, what do we do when he comes? There is another command in the text. I told you it was coming, and that's in verse 9. It says, resist him. Resist the devil. That word for resist that Peter uses here is the same word, ironically, that Paul writes when he talks about Peter himself. So when Paul and Peter got into their little tiff uh, in Galatians chapter 2, Peter was, uh, he, he was showing favoritism to the Jews, and Paul opposed him, literally resisted him here, to his face. It, it's the word that's used when Alexander the metalworker opposed Paul. It's an active opposition against one's enemy or one with, whom dis- one with whom a person disagrees. So how? How do we resist him? It says in the text to be firm in the faith. That's how we resist him. This isn't something that, that this resistance isn't something we have to muster up on our own. It's not something we have to achieve on our own. 
This isn't a battle we have to fight as though somehow Jesus needs our help to finish what he started on the cross. The active opposition of the devil is to trust in the finished work of Christ. We resist by trusting. Where the devil seeks to slander Christ, we believe the promises of the word. We know and believe them and confess them. Where the devil seeks to remind us of our failures and to become bitter and to hate God because of our sin, because we can't do enough. We remind ourselves what God said. He said, it is finished. We believe that Christ paid it all and nothing remains in our debt. Our debt has been canceled at the cross. We say along with Paul then, when when Satan tries to attack us and condemn us and slander us and say, did God really say? We say, "Uh, what about you, you filthy sinner? We say with Paul, who will bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. That's the promise. You have a savior. To, To trust in the promises of Christ, to borrow another analogy from scripture, is to be putting on daily that armor of God. How many of you remember the armor of God from that soldier that was in, in a, it, it's on the wall of your Sunday school classroom. Anybody have that? Okay, oh, that's crazy. I wish I would have designed that because that person's rich, right? Uh, th- this putting on the armor of God, it's donning the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, putting on the shoes ready with the gospel of peace. It's taking up the shield of faith to extinguish extinguish. Satan's flaming darts. It's to charge with the sword, which is the word, whereby the lies of Satan are slashed to pieces by the truth of Christ. How many of you have have studied that chapter or that passage of, of the armor of God and caught this? To wear the full armor of God is to what? It's to don truth, righteousness, goodness, good news, faith, salvation, God's word, this is basically telling you is to don yourself with Christ. He is those things, the truth, the righteousness, the good news, faith, salvation, the word made flesh. It's to wear him, to be hidden in him, to be viewed by God the Father as he would be viewing Christ. This is the promise. This is how we resist the devil. It's the promise described in Galatians 3.27, which I mistakenly asked Grace to read in class yesterday, but it was good that you did because it reminded me of it, right? For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you are a baptized child of God today, you have worn the, the armor of God and you're ready to defend and resist the devil. We can be confident that God is a good promise keeper. He can't fail No lion can devour the one who is wearing Christ. And the devil's lies vanish in the face of truth. As one hymn says, who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror. And yes, I've been quoting from the end of Romans 8 because the first years you need to be memorizing those things. Yeah. So in this refining process, we persevere, Satan prowls. It's a battle, but it's not the end of the story because the promise is that God perfects. We've talked about Peter, he says, knowing that these same sufferings have been happening by our brothers and sisters throughout the world, but we're not alone in this, but that alone isn't the comfort. Suffering has an expiration date. It isn't the end. It's not how the story concludes. Peter's been clear from the very beginning, and it's kind of a bookend on both sides of this book. Uh, It's this idea that suffering is universal, but it's only for a, quote, little while. He uses that phrase in our text today. He used it in chapter one. It's this, in this battle with this roaring lion, we feel like we're gonna lose. We feel like it goes on and on. Feels like the end won't come. Things won't be okay. But Peter says, and he uses this phrase a little while to remind us that even though it feels like forever, it won't compare to eternity, literally without time, and the eternal glory of Christ. And th- this gives us one of uh, the, the courage to sing one of my favorite hymns. Anybody sing the, the hymn For All the Saints? Okay, not super popular. Uh, because it's a little bit longer. I think we've sung it here a few times, so you should remember it. But one of the lines in that song goes like this, and I love it. 
It says, and when the fight is fierce, the warfare long, steals on the ear the distant triumph song, and hearts are brave again, and arms are strong. Alleluia. When the suffering is over, God promises to do four things for us into this, in this text, and they're related. He says he's going to restore us, confirm us, strengthen us, and establish us. Tom Schreiner, who's the New Testament scholar and commentator, he says that these words taken together emphasize that God will give us exactly what is needed to persevere to the end, and what was broken will one day be fully restored. What was stolen from us in the suffering will one day be good, be made right again. The dross that is removed in the refiner's fire will be gone. What is left will be the purest of gold. What is left will be Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. It'll be us like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, 2. One of the the books I appreciate and I've read to my children at different times, it's imperfect as any any uh, rendering, human rendering of, of some of the, the Bible stories are, but the Jesus storybook Bible. I love how Sally Lloyd-Jones concludes that book when she is telling the story of the revelation. She's writing from the perspective of John and, and she says this, in some mysterious way that would be hard to explain, everything was going to be more wonderful for having once been so sad. And the ending of the story was going to be so great, it would make all the sadness and the tears and everything seem just like a shadow that is chased away by the morning sun. To that God, our refining God, to him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Father in heaven, I do thank you for these promises. Thank you for the assurances of your word that though the war is fierce, there is a distant triumph song. And therefore our hearts can be brave. Our arms can be strong in this battle. Give us a heart and a desire to know and to learn and to grow in your word. Remind us that we have been clothed with Christ. And in that armor we battle, we battle our enemy with the assurances and the promises that Christ provides. Thank you for the victory that's there. I pray for each student here today. As we uh, wind down this school year, as some of them go on to different ministry opportunities, some go to work and various things, some are leaving for for, uh, the last time, some are, are returning. In whatever circumstance, give them the strength to believe these promises to recognize that in this refining fire of this life that they have the tools to battle. Give them strength, give them peace, give them assurance. We ask all this in Jesus' name, amen.